Welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to the Future of Money podcast. My goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have a one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. My guest today is a co-founder of Animoca Brands, one of the trailblazers of the global NFT revolution, Yatsui. Yat, great to have you with us today on the Future Money Podcast. Great, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yet before we kick it off, I have to say, uh, I've known you for, for, for some time. We've been on stage many times together, but I think it'd be very interesting for our audience if you can share a bit of your background, especially the part that I think many people don't know, that you grew up in Vienna to Chinese parents and you even studied uh, music at the beginning. And it would be very interesting to see the journey that brought you here to put things in, cost, uh, in, in context for our, for our audience. No, oh, yeah, I thank you. I think uh, one of the things that's always interesting when you think about your past is, you know, what are the decisions that you're making today and maybe making in the future are actually often shaped by your experiences in the past. And I th- certainly think my childhood growing up as effectively a minority in Austria. And for those of you who don't know, Austria, uh, I mean, it's a friendly, nice, beautiful place, you know, most famous and most Austrians will scoff at that uh, for the sound of music, even though you know basically <laughs> most of the activities in terms of the recording and production of uh, even the music actually had nothing to do with Austria. But the but you know most most people will probably know it for that, and obviously Mozart and Mozart Kugel and that kind of stuff. But the place is a very creative place. Uh, it is also one of the reason why my parents moved there actually as students to study music in the 60s. And because there weren't that many Chinese people, actually, there are probably none, (laughs) probably one of the very few, that's how they found each other. Because it was literally like, you know, how do I identify sort of sort of that that beacon in a haystack? Because you could easily see it. Oh, look, another Chinese person. Hey, let's chat. Right. Anyway, so 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 they had me. But as an only Chinese child in a musical family growing up in Vienna, in Austria, you know, music wasn't a choice of mine. It was just destiny. It was like, oh, we are musicians, so you must be one, too. Anyway, that's kind of what happened. And the idea also, you know, was for me and our family, the idea that we would ever come back to the sort of the Asia slash Chinese speaking region uh, was was completely unheard of. Because, of course, in the 70s, cultural revolution and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's a little bit like, you know, telling you, you know, we'll go back to the war zone. No, there was no thinking around that. So it was all about cultural integration into Europe. You know, my mother tongue is German, right? You know, I, I didn't have many sort of Chinese friends growing up. It was just part of the culture. But through that approach, I think I learned a little bit about sort of, you know, I, I recognize that growing up very much as a local in terms of language and culture, but evidently very clearly looking different. And then my parents also would make Chinese food, right? And we were we probably had the best Chinese food around the neighborhood <laughs> because even though Vienna was famous for many Chinese restaurants, uh, many of them were, they were never open because they were probably just uh, sort of fronts for immigration, frankly speaking. <laughs> yeah. But 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 uh, but uh, at, at that time, you know, it was I was sort of in this sort of a halfway house of being Chinese culturally in one way, but then my parents really wanting me to be as integrated as possible to local culture. And actually, not speaking Chinese to me at all. So I, 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 we spoke German, right? And so it was a very, it was, it was all intentional because it was of that generation that was saying, "We're going to leave this this region and we're not coming back because at the time it was such a horrible experience." But that got me into computers because uh, I, you know, I wasn't uh, a super talented musician. You know, you know, some people comment about, "Oh, music teaches you creativity and everything," and that's probably true. But in my case, it taught me really mostly about discipline. Because playing music at a performance level is a hard discipline because it is about perfection and is it about that sort of pinpoint perfection. Like when you play a wrong note, everyone hears it, right? It's not, <laughs> you don't have any ability to make a mistake. And that's basically really what I learned in the process of learning music. And because I wasn't as talented as my fellow peers, I had to work much harder, which is what brought me into technology. Because in the field of composition, I ended up finding that using a computer 
allowed me to compose faster than other people because I could basically use a keyboard to do so. So I ended up cheating a little bit, you could say, right? Because of course, at that time, using a computer was like cheating. It's like math in a calculator. Oh, do you actually know your math or do you have to use a calculator? Today, we all accept that many of the solutions, we just use a calculator, it's just obvious, right? But back then, right, if you used any kind of additional support, that was cheating. Anyway, I used the computer to help me compose faster. Uh, that didn't get me much into the sort of good books between, let's say, my teachers. But the software that I posted in um, uh, online, back then on CompuServe, actually uh, got me discovered that way because I put my address, my name details, and then I would just tell people, just for bragging rights, because I was a kid back then, uh, just, you know, send me some money um, if you thought the software was good. And that's what everyone did back then days with public domain and shareware software. But the outcome was that I suddenly started getting checks in the mail and I didn't have a bank account. And that's kind of when it was first moment says, actually, maybe, maybe I should be doing this. And that led eventually to a job at Atari. Yep. Uh, and then from Atari, basically studying computer science in the US. And then in the US, when Atari basically went bust, my first sort of proper entrepreneurial journey as a, as a startup, which eventually led me to uh, building a company that was building virtual reality modeling tools, which is sort of very early forms of VR uh, on, on SGI. And uh, through that, uh, SGI acquired the business. Then I came to Asia, Japan, Taiwan, and then Hong Kong. And in the early 90s, when I was in Hong Kong, I discovered that I couldn't really get my email, which for me was very common. And so because my father's from Hong Kong, I had permanent residency and decided, well, why not I just hang around here and start up one of Hong Kong's first internet service providers, which was in 93 called Hong Kong Online, which, you know, was, a, was, was very early uh, back at that day. I think the total internet population, um, at least on a TCP IP basis, was probably like, I don't know. 60,000, maybe 100,000 people, like something super, super small. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that was sort of how it all got started. And then, of course, after that, you know, Outblaze, and then later on, we sold that to IBM, and then and it started in the gaming side. Anyway, there's a whole history, uh, but basically, 93 is kind of where my Hong Kong journey started and building up technology companies in that space. And that's remarkable how this journey, especially with the musical element, and you mentioned Atari as well, that you worked there. I think it's incredible how your past and different elements of it are all coming together now in what you're building now. And what about the gaming side, obviously, with Outplays, but also with uh, with Animal Code right now, I would say in the gaming space. Like before we talk about NFTs, you guys are obviously a, 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 a very important yes. player. How, do you, how, do you, how did that come about? Well, so first of all, because of Atari, I ended up originally doing composition and getting involved in elements of game development mm -hmm. at Atari, right? Mm -hmm. So that was just an early form. Because, and, but I was more in the media side. So basically, you know, 3D models. Yep. So we were involved in sort of that kind of stuff. Later on, as time went on, um, I think the next big restart in the gaming side, outside of being a player, like I was very active with multi-user dungeons, MUDs at the time, right? Uh -huh. And then, you know, playing in you know, Ultima Online and like all the early, early game Game, yep. uh, game worlds. And you could say that I, I was effectively living the metaverse in a sort of very textual way. <laughs> right? 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 And we were literally sort of meeting friends and having relationships with people that you actually never met in person, couldn't even visualize, right? Your avatar was a description. I mean, that's what, what it was yep. back, in, back in the 90s. And so we were really sort of the early forms uh, of, of that community building. And which is why for us, it was, you know, the, the, what the internet promised was really something that I certainly, uh, and the people who I was involved with, could see because we were already emotionally attached to it because we had friendships and relationships that were entirely virtual with people we had never met in person. Right? And so, 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 so that, was, that was how it started. So it was very natural for us. It wasn't that different. And I, I remember, I think it was in 2000, I sort of wrote an article back then in Asia Week, which is no longer around, yeah. but uh, where I was just talking about how everyone's going to just, you know, meet their partners online and sort of yeah. live online. I, and sort I of, was going to ask yeah. you about this. Because, because you know, yeah, I found that article online, and actually, I was, I was, as I was, I mean, I've known it for some time, but I wanted to also properly research before the show. And I found that article where you're 27 years old in the year 2000, and, and you literally mentioned in that article, yet yeah, that the internet will change the world. Right. And this was 21 years ago. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, why, the reason why I felt that um, is because I lived it, right? So because I was already in it, right? It, I, wasn't, I wasn't just theorizing it or looking at it from outside. I was already playing in multi-user dungeons. I was sending emails. Yeah. I was building email platforms. I was building websites. I was talking to everyone. So, you know, call it an echo chamber, if you will. 
But within that echo chamber, it was reality. And that reality was only going to grow as far as I was concerned. Now, the road to growth, of course, was super bumpy. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't, it obviously wasn't smooth sailing at all, but it was just something that was obvious to me. And so gaming is just that natural extension of that because I was already gaming before. And how do we make that reality feel deeper? It came through games. In fact, in 2000, in, in the early 2000s, we actually started some of the very first online games mm -hmm. as a publisher first. Uh, and of course, it was pretty primitive at the time, but you know, we had sort of MMOs, right? And we built basically uh, multiplayer games, not on mobile at the time, it was all PC. And because we had one of the biggest email platforms out there, we couldn't make much money from it. We said, well, we have all these users. How can we get users to sort of give us some revenue? Let's make some games, right? So we ended up getting early in the game side. And where this all split out was when IBM came in and wanted to buy Outplace. And Outplace at that point, uh, sort of its biggest business was ultimately a cloud computing center. Although it wasn't built as cloud, back then it was called application service provider. It was mm -hmm. effectively what we know today now as a cloud computing service for uh, enterprise services like email, you know, and, 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 and sort of, you know, corporate ser uh, services. And so IBM bought that business. And when they bought that business in uh, uh, 2008, 2009, I had a three-year non-compete on anything enterprise, and they didn't want to take any of the entertainment pieces, which was the IP side, the licensing side. So we had, we were doing a lot in stickers also, and we were doing um, sort of games. So all of that ended up sort of standing behind, and we're like, okay, well, let's keep building out that business. At that point, you know, I, the the mobile phone was very interesting, and you know, I was already an iPhone user. Uh, I thought, well, maybe we should do something in the gaming side. That seems really interesting, mm -hmm. and so we started going heavily into. Uh, mobile gaming in 2009 uh, in terms of early research. Now, we did originally educational stuff, but in 2010, we really went heavy into mobile games. And at that point, you got to understand the App Store wasn't fully deployed yet, and there was no way to do in-app purchases. So, mm -hmm. so there was no way to truly monetize in the way we know today. But we ended up launching uh, a title called Pretty Pet Salon. This was in <clears throat> uh, late 2010, and okay. IAP was maybe three months old. But like it was really, really early where that mechanism was around. And we decided, you know what? Maybe instead of making a pay-to-play, we'd do it in a purchase. So free, and then you basically buy in app yeah. store. And uh, in January, when we made that switch in 2011, January, you know, Pretty Pet Salon just took off. And as a result, we became uh, one of the first, at that point, I would say one of the top five mobile game companies in the world. And they just catapulted us onto the scene because our mobile gaming division, which was making no money at all, went from 600,000 US dollars in the first month to a million dollars of revenue in the second month, you know, on a monthly basis. And it just, it just exploded. So we said, wait, I think we have something here. So, <laughs> so the, but that experience also uh, led us towards the blockchain journey, not just because we were doing stuff in the gaming space, because we became so prolific and we discovered that we could really discover, uh, sort, of, sort of effectively hack the discovery system at the App Store by launching many apps. And so we did this in an incredibly prolific manner where we would launch apps so frequently that basically of the top 20 apps, because back then in the App Store, top 20 was kind of all that mattered, uh, we had like up to 12 of the top 20. So we literally dominated the store. And Apple didn't like that. But of course, Apple didn't have an office in Hong Kong. They were out in Cupertino. They didn't know who you were as far as they were concerned. We're nameless renegades, you know, in the Asia Pacific region, you know, <laughs> basically doing bad things. So they, they removed... Um, uh, all of our apps overnight. Uh, I think it was in, in January, or February, and it was it was it was really bad because basically they evaporated our entire business overnight. They, um, of course, our revenue streams were obviously gone. Uh, all the staff that were working for us at that point, you know, 150 people were like, "What the hell is going on with our life?" And of course, millions of users who were playing our games at the time were also going, "What went on?" So you know, if you go online and search about that, you can probably find some some questions around that. And of course. We never, never had an appeals process. There was no judiciary we could go to. We could talk to anyone. We just lost our mm -hmm. entire business. And while we recovered through Android a little bit, we never reclaimed our position. And I think this is one of the big goals around decentralization as well, around the deplatforming risks that we constantly go after because we are living on other people's rules. And we can talk about that a little later. But you know, that's another part of that experience which I think is perhaps even the bigger part that led me sort of into sort of being a big believer in what is blockchain. But that's the gaming purpose and the gaming mission around that. And then all the weaknesses around it, the other thing is, is that when we started exploring the gaming space, in the beginning, going from you know the, the console PC gaming space into free to play was really a marketing and a what I call gaming mass adoption strategy. 
because gamers really struggled playing uh, on these console games, like the, the non-professional gamers, because there was too many buttons, it was really hard to do. And the big innovation of mobile gaming is it wasn't the fact that it was mobile. That was, frankly, circumstantial as far as I'm concerned. What mobile gaming enabled was uh, hyper-casual gameplay that essentially mass amateurized gameplay. And that's actually when we got into the hundreds of millions of gamers to what is now 2.7 billion gamers. Because suddenly everyone who wasn't super expert could be an expert. Think of Candy Crush. Mm -hmm. I just swipe my fingers mm -hmm. and hey, that sounds really good. Or Angry Birds, I just pull. And I don't have to work that hard, relatively speaking, and I can still feel really good about it. It's kind of how we became all expert photographers because with Instagram, we could easily take a photo and yeah, exactly. hey, that looks really great. But you know, we didn't need to have the skill of managing the aperture or doing that, right? That was really the big innovation that drove that in. And we learned a lot. But as time went on, gaming became predatory because of the revenues involved. And they had to find more and more ways to make money from you and never giving anything back because that was essentially the entertainment. And it started getting so, you know, pretty bad. And we looked at that and said, I don't know if that is a sustainable culture that we want to build. But actually, yeah, so you raise a lot of good points here, right? And I think before I delved in into the NFT angle, like when you look at the, when you look at, when you look right now at the future of, of gaming, do you believe that in the literally next couple of years, there's 2 billion plus gamers around the world, uh, NFTs will be core to gaming and also that we'll have more decentralization within the gaming industry and we won't have a lot of these centralized platforms that are kind of the gatekeepers uh, to what games you can have, but also how, what kind of uh, activities you can have on these platforms as well? So I certainly hope so. That's what we're building for, right? And I think the big idea behind non-fungible tokens is because it gives you the true property of those assets that mm -hmm. the, essentially the economic activity around the NFTs basically becomes that pool in which other game developers have to access in order to grow their businesses because the liquidity, the community, think of it as a kind of latent energy that sits there because of the yeah. ownership of these assets becomes just too much to sort of ignore. We've seen that already with things like open source. Right? I mean, back yeah. in the day, it was, you know, open source was a joke. In fact, when we built Outplays in, in, in 98, everyone, like, partially because we were kids, but partially also because, uh, because we, uh, you know, were building on open source, many investors at the time were like, why would I invest in open source? That seems like a really silly idea. You're making IP and then you're giving it to others. Like, what do you have as a business? Like, it doesn't seem like you'll retain any special knowledge. Therefore, what's the point in investing in you? You guys are all going to go down, right? Obviously, it didn't turn out that way. And uh, open source is now that incredible amount of knowledge and power that sits there that everyone can access, contribute back into, which allows essentially even a five-person team to compete with a thousand-person team because they can yeah. avail themselves to all that knowledge. But the thousand-person team can't ignore it because they can't compete with the network effect that sits inside code. And so what's happened with assets is we don't have that network effect. And so the hope is that if we can build out a community, a group of assets that have a network effect, then all the other uh, sort of game studios want access to that uh, sort of assets that mm -hmm. have a network effect. And therefore, we open up these game worlds. We don't think it's going to be game companies just voluntarily opening up. We have to give them a strong incentive to do so. So on this network effect, I think it's a very interesting point you raise yet on the network effect of basically that NFTs can enable in the gaming in the gaming world. Like just maybe for the, for the audience, like walk us through. Let's say ten years from now, right? What will be the practical experience on a gamer, uh, and how would the NFT and this whole broader, let's say, opening up of decentralization movement of gaming, how would it look in practice, and what would be the experience that a user will, will will be able to witness? Well, so let's start with sort of the thing that will make an NFT powerful, right? And I think the way one should think of a, a good NFT, right, is that it is very openly composable and designed in such a manner that it can plug into communities easier and bring along the communities because of whatever design they have in mind, right? That means that in a sort of web one, web two thinking, imagine each NFT to basically have like API plugins of some sort, right? And these API plugins allow anyone to bring it in. Now, someone may not bring it in at all, but the point is that if you do, you don't just bring in that one NFT, you bring in the entire community that is associated with that NFT. Kind of like what you see with F1 Delta Time or Sandbox or even CryptoPunks, right? You know, you, you, you support one asset, the entire community can be brought into it. So that's a power of that network effect because you give yourself access 
to that community. These assets can then exist across multiple metaverses because more people say, I want access to that, so, which means like with our F1 cars, you can use them in our game, but you can use them in another world or you can yeah. incorporate them in sandbox. So you can do all sorts of things that you want with it, right? So that's one simple example. But because it's peer-to-peer -peer business relationships that are permissionless, basically the relationship is between the service provider and the owner of the asset. It no longer involves the platform, which typically the game is. And what that means is, is that you have an additional unlocking of economic activity because that economic substance that already exists there essentially just sort of supercharges, which is how it works in the real world for us, for instance, right now as well. Right? I mean, if I, if I buy a car, I don't need to go back to Tesla to seek permission to hire a driver or to hire a mechanic or to paint the car. I can do that. Right? So instead, I go hire another person who will paint the car for me and I transact directly with him. And that economic activity as a sum of all parts is much larger than the actual pure sale of the car itself, right? So that's how economic value is, is impacted. And because of the service infrastructure that is now developed between the community of whether it's Tesla mechanics or Volkswagen painters or whatever it is that will be, you then have an asset that has value beyond just I own a car because you can now access the entire peer-to-peer -peer business infrastructure that was set up to establish support of these cars, right? A mechanic doesn't have to just support one car. He can support 50 other cars. Or how many people of us make decisions to buy anything because it has better service? Because I can get not just a warranty service, but, oh, I'm buying this car because I know that the mechanical service is either better or cheaper or whatever, right? Or I make decisions around computers I'm buying because there's local support as opposed to something, you know, it's not just about price, it's about what and benefits I can get. These are economic decisions that have a network effect, right? Uh, brands are a network effect. And so these digital assets will have this network effect now, or actually have this network effect. And so they can exist across. You know, our NFTs are used in things like lending, mortgages, and yields. We have nothing to do with them. They just do it themselves. Yeah. So on that perspective, yes, I mean, do you see the next power players in the world of gaming? Right now, obviously, the platforms are the game developer, game companies, right? Uh, but do you believe in the next couple of years, there'll be the NFT developer, and it kind of, those who are putting NFTs on the market? And using your analogy of the car, or maybe like, you know, the, the one I was thinking about is like a basketball. If I buy a basketball, I can play in the basketball court that I want. I can play on whatever I want, right? You get, you're giving the asset that actually I can use, and that actually kind of changes the dynamics of it. Who you think will be, let's put it this way, who you think will be the winners and the losers in this new paradigm that we went into with gaming, where it comes and interfaces with NFTs and broader decentralization? So, you know, when you think of it in terms of um, pure asset perspective, I actually don't think there will be winners and losers in the traditional sense, because I think there's a lot of latent uh, economic substance that exists in these platforms that basically are unlocked. Uh, so I, I think of it as like we're, we're taking these sort of game systems today, which are feudal, right? And we're moving them from the medieval age to the modern age and introducing democratic and capitalist values. Actually, as a whole, actually, it became more capital, more money, more value. But what has been lost is centralized power, right? So the monarchs of their time have lost power. So you could say that they've lost power. But, you know, yeah. the Queen of England is, what, still the wealthiest or one of the wealthiest people yeah. in the UK? So you can't, really, and it's arguable whether her wealth might have been even more, is maybe even larger because of the global trade and activity, you know, that has happened in the UK. So I, I don't know that she's necessarily struggling, right? Let's just put it this way. However, uh, when it comes to the power structure in terms of deciding what happens, of course, there was a loss of power. But we've seen also in time what happens to any centralized power structure in history, they end up going away. Either they end up losing to another centralized power structure, or they find a way around a decentralized power structure of some sort. I mean, you know, parliament, democracy, LegCo, I mean, these are all quasi adoptions of a form of decentralization for one main purpose, which is essentially managing a kind of trust layer across groups that is hard to do when it's centralized because of the lack of accountability Absolutely. and all that stuff, right? So I think this is where this is where we think games will have to go. Like I think if games want to last and if games want to really be something that is there forever, which is not a concept that is today possible, really, then it has to end up being in a DAO structure because the owners of them are the ones who have to be sort of 
have to care the most about it, right? Like, I, th I think any civil society, which a game ultimately at the metaverse is, right, uh, ends, up, ends up finding success because everyone in the community has a vested interest. If only 1% has a vested interest, then only 1% will ever care about its existence, right? But if you want to get everyone involved, and that's the big democratic experiment, right? But if clearly we've seen that as long as you get 30 or 40% involved, it can still survive in good form, right? Um, but if only 1% care, then you may have a problem. And so I think this is the big thing about games as a metaverse as well. Games, how many games last longer than even one year? Hmm, not that many, right? How many games last longer than three, then five, then 10, then 20, right? I mean, basically, you can start counting down. If you thought of a game as an empire or a kingdom or country, then we have a litany of failed states over and over again, right? And it's for that reason, because it's centralized. The economies are inflationary. It's really there only to be really benefiting the one percentile that are playing, those, that are owning these games. And then because it's that, it necessitates that they extract as much value out of the game as they can. And then when it's done, they move on. Personally, I think of it as a kind of parasitic relationship with your consumers, which we think needs to change. And that's why NFTs are so powerful. So actually on that point, uh, yeah, so when you talk about NFTs, obviously quite powerful and they can revolutionize that's a gaming and frankly other industries as well, which we'll talk about in a second. But let's say when it comes to valuations of NFTs, yes, NFTs can be quite powerful, especially in the gaming context and other decentralized contexts. Do you believe some of the valuations we are seeing today in NFTs are justifiable? You think it's a hype? Where do you think things will be heading from that perspective? I mean, value is very much in the eye of the beholder, right? That said, I think that I don't think that the NFTs, broadly speaking, are crazy in value. Now, of course, I may have a biased perspective because we are issues of number of these NFTs that are selling for a lot of money. But I see it as essentially a movement from rental to ownership. And so if you can derive the kind of value that you can get and understand what that rental value is for that asset, then you can very easily calculate an ownership ratio. Right? Is it a multiple of 20, 30, 40, 50 X? That's, that depends, right? On the, on the longevity value for it. But if there is an income cap capacity outside of the emotional and sentimental value, then I think you have a base fundamental calculation for that. A few weeks ago, we had a car sold in a secondary market for about 360,000 US from F1 Delta time. And you know, for the casual observer, it's like, that's crazy. I could buy a real Lamborghini for that. But one of the headlines on Dab Raider was interesting. It basically um, was a headline around the, the sale of this car, and it basically put it next to another sports car, I think it was a Lamborghini, and said both cars cost 360,000. Which one makes you money? So, so here's the interesting thing, right? You can buy a Lamborghini, and it's beautiful, and it's valuable, and it's worth a lot of money, the same amount as that NFT, but does that car give you yield? Can you use it for income? And the answer is no. So it's all relative if you understand it that way. So I think there is a very clear valuation proposition that happens with NFTs. It's just that because of the media interaction, we've basically gotten lost in it a little bit because, you know, everyone thinks the next NFT has to be the next Mona Lisa, which, you know, doesn't really work. Uh, but how would you value yet uh, an NFT? Let's say the example of the F1 car you just mentioned that sold for over $300,000, right? Let's say if you, you would look at it from a traditional financial perspective, what would be the, the, the revenue streams that you would have from that car? And how would that be different from a tra traditional Lamborghini that you can argue you can also rent out as well and, and, and do other things with it as well? Well, what's a, for instance, what's a taxi medallion worth 30 years ago in its income potential? And where do you see that grow? And then you can easily calculate, okay, I'm buying a taxi medallion because I have the right to basically drive a taxi and earn income. And if I'm assuming that the city in which I buy the medallion from is going to grow in population and grow in popularity, then presumably the medallion will go up in value because it becomes a bigger interest-bearing, well, not interest-bearing, but income exactly. sort of generating asset because I'll be driving more passengers around, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of perhaps one way to consider it. Uh, from one perspective, but there is labor involved because you actually have to race and drive and get involved. So it's not passive, but it is certainly one where you have to be actively involved. So someone has to drive the car and someone has to win competitions. It's basically esports, but just at scale, right? So that's that's um, that's perhaps one way one way to consider it. 
So it's interesting in a way, like basically buying an NFT of a, of, a, of a Formula One car. You know, in a way, it's basically like owning your Formula One team in a way, right? Where you Correct. get obviously the racing and the, the prizes right. that come with That's it, right. but obviously having it in the, in the virtual world. And also, I think you can argue yet as well that if I own certain NFTs, there is kind of also lending market as well. I may want to give it to you for X amount of time. You want to you want to use it, let's say, for certain skins in certain, some of the games that you may want to use. You can, you can see how this kind of lending market that may be created that doesn't exist at all. And right it now. has been created now. And it has been created exactly. by third parties in which we're not involved in because they just see a, a market opportunity because, oh, well, if this car can generate this kind of income driving it, someone who has skill is willing to pay for it. And in fact, today we have several racing teams set up by sponsors who have paid good money to build these teams, but hired separate drivers uh, for that purpose. So we do have these racing teams for that same purpose because there is a clear economic impact. You know, whether the yield and return on this investment is, you know, worthwhile, that's maybe a different question altogether. But, you know, we see this, you know, around the world. If you create a, an economic opportunity, market efficiencies tend to come in to basically take advantage of it. And that's just another way of, you know, making a market efficient. And I think I'm very happy we're discussing this, yeah, because I think when we talk about the NFT craze, obviously we talk about Beeple and the $69 million paint, a digital piece of art and all the brouhaha around it. But I think what, what I think if I had one criticism to make to the non-crypto media or definitely to the mass media is that we don't talk about these items a lot. We don't talk about actually a lot of these NFTs could have actually real value, could have actually cash flows if you think about it, you know, and obviously depending on the scarcity and the usage. And like you said, it's taking a bet on the platform. So if I believe that this particular game, like let's say the sandbox, which I know is something you guys develop, is going to be the number one ecosystem people are going to play in that has a certain value. In the same way, teams spend a lot of money for traditional Formula One and not, not to other racing venues because they, they know that's where the eyeballs are, that's where the sponsors are, right? So I think that brings a very interesting uh, conversation from, um, from that perspective. But I want to ask you also on the, uh, the generational divide. So for example, when I talk to my students, for example, or to young people about NFTs, uh, everybody's very comfortable with owning a digital asset, like an NFT. However, when I speak to, let's say, older people, let's call them more experienced uh, people to be more polite, uh, there's really this kind of misconception where they're like, no, if I'm able, I should be able to touch it physically to, to be able to prove that I own it. And to be fair, it's a very the, similar to the debate that we've had a couple of years ago when we used to try to explain to people what is Bitcoin and an asset that is digital. How do you see that we can bridge that divide? You think one day there will be the NFT world will also kind of have this like physical interaction as well uh, or it's really a generational matter uh, that will just you know evolve as as people grow older and, and we're not, we're not going to be able to fix that oh, maybe we can go a step back here because i understand this question of ownership if i can't touch it do i really own it because can i put it in my pocket or can i actually see it to see if it's mine right and i think we have to go back to challenge the question of what is ownership in fact right ownership is consensus and who gives that consensus well, back in the day, 10,000 years ago, consensus was people who didn't know how to read and write, and they just agreed on a table, that's yours, because everyone in the village knows who you are. That's yours. That's your, you know, rock, right? That's your hut. That's your cow, right? I mean, you know, we know that because you grew up with that, and nobody will challenge it. The problem is that as time grew, as civilizations grew, we no longer had human consensus. Right? We had to basically find a form of written consensus or central authority that said, you own that cow. Because I don't know if you really own that cow. So someone has to fear it. So you go through some central registry and says, I own the cow. Okay, that's, that's ownership. And we've now, over you know, centuries, have gotten accustomed to this idea that actually ownership is given by someone, not one that we actually have. Right? So, so we just intrinsically accept that a certificate from the government is a license of ownership. That's the whole challenge here, right? So we've grown up with that thinking. And so now we feel like if I don't have something that gives it that value, then if I don't see and touch it, I can't really own it. But you know, when you think about art, when you think about, you know, for instance, sort of, you know, precious violins, what in fact is the violin worth without the certificate? Not that much, because you need to prove that it's really that violin from a Stradivarius, for instance. And if you don't have that, the value of the violin may just be a piece of wood for some people. That's the same thing here. So you need the certificate to prove you have that ownership. And, that, and to me, that entire relationship is virtual to begin with, right? Like, you own, like, like when we sit at a table and I use a pen, you accept that it's my pen. 
you don't say, show me your, <laughs> your certificate to say, this is your pen or not your pen, right? We just accept it because of social consensus. And so blockchain just solves this on a mass scale. So in my sense, I, I say to people like that, all of your concepts of ownership anyway are all virtual to begin with, right? They're, they're not actual real in the sense that, you know, who said it's real, right? And, and, and then you have a central authority who in itself, right? Think about our ownership with land. If a government is overthrown, your land is worth nothing, right? Whatever you used to own, worth nothing, right? Just because the central authority that was at claim is gone. So, so I, think, I think this is the part that we don't appreciate and where blockchain actually really embeds the ownership in a permanent manner that is inalterable, right? That's, that's a powerful thing. Now, going into the acceptance of the virtual plane, the issue with the virtual plane is that because many traditional people always thought of their virtual life as simply a support extension, you know, and everyone says, well, what's so important about, you know, do you value your physical and virtual life more? Well, most people will say, obviously, your physical life, right? Because I live and breathe and I eat and everything, right? But, you know, when you think about things like your human dignity, your human rights, these are all very sort of high level, frankly, virtual concepts, right? They're, they're not written down except with expectations. We expect them. We expect our freedoms and we expect the ability that we have human rights and human dignity. But we don't have it written form in written form in that manner. And the same is basically true for, for our involvement with digital assets because we don't own anything digitally, but we gave it up because we never thought it was important. For the younger generation, they live digitally, so they understand its priority. Now, what happens, and this is what I tell to people who, who, who challenge this, what happens if you get digitally deplatformed, which you can? What happens if you lose your Facebook access, your WhatsApp access, your WeChat, your Tencent, your Amazon access. Who are you as a person? Are you worth as much? Do you have a stronger network? Can you make friends? Can you make future friends? In fact, your human worth just declined because you're not online. Who are you if you're not on LinkedIn or on Google? And that's the problem. We don't own that. And I think a lot of people, once they accept that, oh, they say, you know what, actually, I don't own my digital life because actually Google or Facebook owns it. That is when people start to realize that your digital self may not even just be equally important. Maybe it's more important even. And that's where digital property is important because then, you know, again, our relationship is virtual. But, you know, I, I know it's not straightforward for people who, 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 who think analog, but our relationships of ownership is, from my perspective, um, virtual anyway. Absolutely. And I think you raised a very good point because, you know, if you think about, like you said, these big platforms, right, the, the Facebooks of this world, obviously, initially, we're giving out our data for free just to be able to access it, right? And of course, over the last couple of years, we saw this whole big debate come over regarding basically data and should we, how can we monetize our data and really actually that now give rise to hold the NFT of owning literally and being able to monetize what you have. So I think it's a very, very interesting how this evolution is happening. So, you know, you, you can argue that it was a natural evolution, but uh, I think you're right, the dynamics of ownership, digital assets, literally, and I'm not talking about cryptocurrencies, like even NFTs and the yeah. broader digital assets will have will be very interesting. I think maybe, I want, I want to touch about sorry, one, let me just cover this yeah. one thing, because I think a lot of people don't understand NFTs uh, in that sense, because they look at the people and they say, one piece of art that's sold a lot, and a lot of artists who are not from the crypto world are trying to rush in to make NFTs for the sake of making NFTs as a way to make money and more power to them to make money. But what they don't understand is that actually a really good NFT uh, is an NFT that benefits from the network effect that comes from its community, from you, the creator, and from whoever else is involved with it. And it's really for the first time, you could say it's a data structure that allows the network, to, the network effect to be given by owners of pieces of that network, right? If you think of an NFT as a piece of a network of a community, of an infrastructure, anyone who owns a piece of that infrastructure benefits as a group, right? That network effect belonged to the platform. You didn't know who they were. You couldn't farm it. You could do nothing. You just contributed to it and got nothing for it. But with, you know, blockchain, with NFTs, and even with fungible tokens, right? If you think about in an easier concept, the network effect, the HODL mentality, is really the benefiting of a network effect or a network loss if everyone starts selling, right? That's the very easy thinking. But with non-fungible tokens, it's the same. And, and, and that, that network effect doesn't have to be one of value in terms of dollar value per se, but it could be one of connection, 
right? Where, you know, the more those type of people own these assets, the more I want to be associated or other people want to be associated, like our relationship with brands, you know, like with, well, you know, our choice of shoes or our choice of luxury watches or whatever it is we do. These are all a sort of invisible form of network effect we're tapping into. You know, I have so many questions. I, want to, I know we're getting to the, towards the end, yeah, but a couple of things. I want, to, I want to talk about art and music as well, because I think you're, but just before that, you know, obviously when we talk about network effect and to really make the NFT powerful, obviously the more people you have, the more the community becomes stronger. Do you think actually fractionalization of NFTs will be essential in order to build that ecosystem or make it stronger? For example, if I can go buy the Beeple painting for $69 million, but, or, but if I, I could also separate that, that painting into 69 million pieces and then give more people a stake in it, and that can help with the network effect that you mentioned. Do you have, well, how important do you think is the, the concept of fractionaliz fractionalization when it comes to the network effect of NFTs? So I think fractionalization is an important element of access, right? And so in order to grow any community, you need to offer access. That said, nobody said that NFT access had to be starting off with a $69 million people, right? And I think fractionalization services are very appealing towards people in the financial sector because they clearly understand it, because they like to play with expensive things. And then they like to sort of, you know, parcel it up into products and fractionalization is super attractive that way. So I get it, right? But I think that fractionalization uh, isn't the sort of be all end all solution for, for sort of, let's call it um, mass adoption. It's just one element of it. It's like giving broader access to maybe an asset class and that's great, right? But I see it much more in that light than necessarily our engagement with, you know, I see NFTs broader engagement to be the ones that have meaning and purpose to us individually. Meaning I don't think that our relationship with NFTs have to be which ones make us money. It's more about value. Like, you know, your association with your wedding ring isn't one about, you're not thinking of buying a wedding ring so you can sell it tomorrow for a lot of money, right? You're buying a wedding ring because it's special to you and maybe special to, to your family and sort of, you know, your, your, your kin. And that's good enough. And it becomes priceless over time. And, and it's, it's, that's what matters. And I think this is the part where NFTs are mainstream because of our cultural engagements. And the money and the value aspect legitimizes maybe the perspective. But that doesn't mean that we want to immediately liquidate it. Because I don't think we all are people who only think about money. Money, I, mean, <laughs> I don't think we're all like, okay, how do I profit from this in every single occasion? Some of us do. But I think most of us don't, right? We're much more culturally, uh, much more culturally attuned uh, in that sense, you know. So, so there's a couple of things I want to touch upon before I know we're getting to the end of the show. One of them is actually when it comes to art, right? So because of what you mentioned, right? We, we feel an attachment with often art that we buy or artists that we support. In, in, from your perspective, how do you see the art world would be different? Or how do you see NFTs will revolutionize uh, the art industry over the next five years and 10 years? Well, first of all, I think galleries and gallerists will have a very interesting time in this environment because they used to be the ultimate middleman in the art world. And they still have an important role to play, but their role will have to change because the artist in and of itself used to depend on them. And you could argue that the gallerist was in effect the harvester of the network effect, right? That's what they did. I sell it to you. I have the relationship with the client. I figure it out, whatever, right? And while the gallerist may, the, the artist may accept that the gallerist is that path and you go ahead and do it, he now has access to that data because it's on chain. He knows who the customer is. They can have a direct relationship. And in due course, he or she may decide that I don't need that gallerist anymore because he's not offering that value anymore. So I think that's going to be one big change. What I also think, because of the way that the network effect builds, this might be the one time, well, it had there been previous times, perhaps one of the better times in history where a creator can not only reclaim sort of their rightful place, as it were, because they can get appropriate royalties and, and all that stuff, but they can benefit from the growing network effect in due course, which is something that artists didn't have before, because once you sold it, you sold it. And, you know, the network effect isn't just the benefit of, oh, I sell it for more money and I get 10%. That's obviously one element of the network effect because a smart contract can track that and audit it and so on. It's also the fact that I can actually connect everyone in my community in one group. It's like every artist is effectively their own social network through their NFTs, yeah. their own club of people that can connect together. And I know who they all are and, I don't, and they're not disintermediate anymore. And I can harvest the network effect. And so I think of this as uh, for, the, for, the, for the artists themselves, frankly, an amazing revolution to not just reclaim their position, but also to enhance themselves. There was this one thing, um, I forgot who it was, 
but you know something I deeply disagreed with, which was the idea that oh NFTs are speculative and it sort of sort of perverts the purpose of art to be just just to, to sort of make speculative instruments and not be creative. And the argument being, let creative people just st focus on being creative and let people you know, who know how to make money focus on making money, right? That's a sort of a specialist viewpoint. I say bullshit to that, right? Because that to me is, is uh, essentially taking knowledge away um, and essentially really segregating people into buckets so you can take advantage of them. And the people who knew about money typically were able to take more significant advantage against those who had creative skills because the world was working around money, right? It's like, it's like, I don't understand financial terms. I don't know how to negotiate something. And actually you took away from them. And, and you know, maybe in the beginning, the purposes, you know, nobody sets out a, a business or a proposal with, with ill intent, right? Like nobody, nobody says, I'm gonna do this to screw you. That's not it. But as time goes on and as they become dominant, they end up building, they end up realizing that in order to protect their position, they have to become monopolistic in their behavior. And, uh, and that, that, that's sort of a counterweight of sort of, you know, where capitalism can go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I think the power of money is a very interesting one. I don't know if you remember, Yati, it was in, before COVID, it was probably in, in uh, October or November 2019. We were speaking at the Christie's event. I remember. Hotel, their big annual event. And I remember when on stage, this was before NFTs, actually, probably nobody knew yes. about NFTs. This was before when uh, Bitcoin, uh, I don't know what Bitcoin has been, maybe less than 15,000. Oh, I remember low. you and I were on it was very, very low. It was definitely a bear market. And I remember you and I were on stage and we we're talking about uh, this, this NFTs and crypto and literally people were laughing at us. And I remember when we left the stage and I, I, I don't know if you remember this, we were going to backstage and I said, this audience is way too old school. Before the art world catches on to the crypto space, digital assets, like uh, it'll be, uh, there's a long way to go. And boy, I was wrong. You know, I, I was I was terribly uh, I miscal miscal miscalculated, but I will never forget. I mean, I was looking at the crowd when you were talking about NFTs back at the time, and incredible how much it came. You know, it's uh, last couple last couple of months, literally after COVID. One thing to ask you, yeah, before we go to our fire round of questions, we literally have less than five minutes left. It's about music. Obviously, you're a musician. You come from a family of musicians, and I'm, you know, and uh, what do you think on the musical side? Obviously, we discussed the impact that uh, NFTs will have a big impact on the art world. When it comes to musicians, do you think musicians will be net benefactors when it comes to the NFT revolution, uh, similar to artists, or they'll be, uh, it'll play out in a different way than it does with uh, different kinds well, of Well, I think it's the same, right? Um, and while I think the music royalty system, because of ASCAP and all these things, are, are more complex, I think it allows for a new way in which musicians can engage, right? Like if you think of it, this is what happened with... Uh, with a sort of Eugenie, you basically have artists basically create like a, you know assets um, for 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 their particular platform for for a million dollars, which is a lot of money for some of these artists, for instance, right? Uh, I think I think the difference here is because of the ownership economics involved, the value can scale up, and therefore artists don't need to basically make for mass. One of the problems that is artists as well, but musicians especially, is that they can't make money from music anymore. They make money from performances because Spotify has become this incredible promotion platform for artists. That's really what it's become. You can't make money streaming millions of times, you know, or even if you get millions of YouTube views, you don't really make that, that, that uh, strong amount of money. And that's because of the fact that essentially, again, the platforms control it. They take their fees and you don't even know whether the reports are right. You just assume that it is, right? Anyway, that aside, that basically means you have, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of creators and, and musical artists that are basically making peanuts on their music. And that's not good. Also, it's on the rules that are set by the platform, basically. And, you know, who said that a million views or sorry, a million music streams for, you know, a performance by Pavarotti is the same as a Justin Bieber performance? I mean, again, no, no disrespect to either. I'm not saying who's worth more. However, the audience and the appeal is probably different and therefore shouldn't be viewed as one-to-one. -one. But on Spotify, it is. It doesn't matter who you are. You're all equal. In that sense, you could say maybe music was the ultimate socialist experiment in terms of creating, creating sort of a kind of musical equity, except it devalued music completely. Right? And now if you think about the way we engage, I grew up in Austria, in Vienna, right? In Vienna, I would go to the opera all the time and you know, opera tickets were more expensive, right? And classical music performance were more expensive. And that's okay, right? And we went in and we enjoyed it. And it was always meant for, 
you know, maximum a few thousand people in, 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 in the opera. And we watched it and we all paid that and we love performance. And then we buy CDs, CDs, right? But we buy CDs and we're happy to spend five times more because it would go for that particular audience. And that's okay. That's all destroyed. That's all gone. Because, because we commoditize music and, in, in, and, and inadvertently made a mistake. And that's also the reason why things like classical music has almost disappeared, at least in the world of Spotify. Like if you want to try and search for a song, it's all about tunes. It's not about performances, right? And outside of the aficionado crowd, it's hard to find it. Unless I know that I'm looking for someone, right? I will not find it as a newcomer because I'm only looking at the top charts. So again, I go back to this. What is NFTs? Well, it's digital property rights. It allows you to build your own social communities. It allows you to create your own network effects and therefore take it out. So I think broadly speaking, I think um, for musicians, NFTs, if they understand how to take advantage of it, is a godsend. This is a great, uh, you know, loop that we did literally from the beginning. Why, why it's important to actually ending up with your classical musicians. Actually, you're absolutely right on that example. How it disappeared from many regards, huh? and this is something NFTs could have hopefully changed. Yeah, this was super exciting. As we finish it off, my regular bell is with me. We're gonna do a fire round of questions. So I'm gonna ask you questions uh, quickly. I want I want like a one or two word answer, and my bell is here as well. So I'm gonna ask them. You answer them, and we're gonna go quickly from from that perspective. Hope you ready well. yet? Let Let's kick it off. So first question, what is your hobby or what is the f one thing you like to do when you're not I'm usually working? trekking or hiking. Trekking and hiking, of course, being in Hong Kong, that's a great thing from that perspective. If any of our listeners is going to Vienna, what is the one thing you recommend they do in Vienna? Wiener Schitzel. Wow, what is a that? Wiener Schitzel, sorry? it's like a, it's a, they, they, it's a, it's a, it's a dish. A Wiener Schitzel. Like, it's, it's, it's yeah, a yeah, dish. of course, yeah. of course, of course. Excellent. Okay, if you could go back to university today, you studied computer science, but if you can go back to university today, what is the one course you recommend each student should take uh, that right now, preparing them for the future of finance or future of money? I'm not sure they should go to university. Ooh, interesting. What do you think they should do? Uh, the, no, I think uh, they should just basically start just getting engaged oh. directly um, and do the work. And, and uh, what I learned in university in, 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 well, for, for computer science was that it was all a waste of time because I already knew everything. The, the problem was, is, is because I was already coding before and what they ended up, yeah. so, so I, 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 didn't, I don't know that university is right for everyone. Man, this is, I think, a whole, whole other podcast we could have on this exact topic as well. What you, if there's one musician, if you could, I can tell you, you, yeah, you can only listen to one musician forever afterwards for the rest of your life, what musician would that be? Probably Mozart, only because of my historical attachment and because I performed it and uh, the technicality involved. I appreciate that, but it's probably not for everyone. Yeah. What is your favorite Netflix series? If there's one Netflix series you really like. Ah, excellent one. Your favorite Nintendo character? Probably Donkey Kong. And why? Donkey <laughs> And if there's one game, again, what's your favorite uh, online game of all time? If there's one game that you really, really liked that you, if you, you, know, you think was the, your favorite one of all time. Online game. Gosh, that's such a hard one. Yeah. I think I have um, particularly fond attachments to Ultima Online. It's not visually the best, it was, but because one of the first ones that was sort of a visual MMO. And really, I think of it was perhaps, yeah, in the visual sense, perhaps the, one of the godfathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers of the metaverse. Yeah, excellent. Last two. If you could have lunch with one other CEO of any business, any other CEO, who would you have lunch with? I'd probably love to have lunch with Bill Gates because I know he's a bit of a crypto skeptic. He doesn't quite understand it. And his article where he wrote Content is King was one of the inspirations as to why we thought that content could really be king with NFTs. And I feel very strongly that if I can make him see that, he'll be a big believer. So yes, would love to have lunch with him. Yeah. Very interesting perspective, actually. And last question, Yad. Thank you again for being with us at the Future Money Podcast. Yad, what is keeping you up at night? What keeps me up at night is the fear that there are a number of actors out there who are trying to centralize and control the blockchain. And so one of the things in the 90s 
basically when we started with the internet and everything, we were really people who were surfing it, right? We were on the waves of the internet, you know, for all the good and the bad, and we were participants. At this moment, at Animal Brands, I think we really feel we have a chance at at least directing it in the right direction. And so what keeps me up at night is to make sure that this is really the decentralized web and that we can have full ownership of our digital rights. That's amazing. Yeah, well, thank you very much for being with us today. It was really a pleasure of seeing you and actually hearing some of your thoughts on NFTs on gaming. I, I, I think it was a fascinating talk and I'm sure our audience would agree on that perspective as well. Yeah, thank you very much for being with us. Where can the audience find, find you if they want to keep in touch with you or they want to follow someone? Well, thank more? you for that. Uh, you, you Usually I post on Twitter, YSIU is my handle. Um, I do have a Medium blog. I don't update it that often. And of course, on the animalcobrands.com website, you can get regular information if you sign up for the mailing list. Yeah, thank you very much for being with us today on the Future of Money. Thank, thank you. you.